share my screen. Let's see. It's a little unorthodox. It's a slide, a deck on a PDF, right? PDF with a deck on edge so I can draw on it. I hope that's okay. Um, so uh, is my screen sharing okay? Can everybody see my screen? Yep, looks yep. good. Okay, perfect, perfect. Um, so tonight for this lightning talk, I am not going to pretend to be even a, even be able to give like a good full appreciation and understanding of what group theory is. It's a huge field. Um, it's deeply rich, beautiful. Um, it's concerned with symmetry and investigating different structures and about how even if they look different, they're essentially the same mathematically. Um, so what I'm going to do tonight is I'm not going to pretend to be able to instill all that intuition. Uh, we're going to start from nothing, as in maybe you took like one week of a linear algebra course, or you know what a matrix is, or you know how to count, or you know modular arithmetic, which you might know if you know Python. Uh, it's like if you crash landed and you're just exploring objects mathematically, what might lead you to start thinking about group theory? What might lead you to form uh, this thing called a group, this mathematical structure? Uh, so yeah. So with that caveat out of the way, I will tell you what I'll try to cover. Um, so first, I'm going to talk about two, uh, if you like linear algebra, these are two interesting matrix groups, and I'll talk about invertibility criteria uh, for matrices. I think this would be of a special interest to uh, data science focused. I know the group isn't data science focused, but if you code in Python, you probably are interested in DS. I'm also going to get to the multiplicative group of integers modulo n. This is a really rich history. Um, it intertwines for Ma's little theorem and the Euler totient function. So for Ma's little theorem, you're going to get, it's to differentiate it from, from Ma's loss theorem, but it's incredibly important and it's uh, kind of the powerhouse for RSA encryption. So I think it's nice that it has a tie in for group theory. In fact, um, in my undergrad, I did a presentation on mathematical cryptography and it, it was all just group theory. So uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, and then I'll establish, I'll give these examples first, I'll establish what a group is mathematically, the precise definition. Usually in a textbook, this is what gets thrown at you first, the group definition, and it doesn't make any sense. There's no motivation for it. Uh, we're going to check back up on the matrix groups and some questions. I'll have like a mini quiz for yourself then. Uh, if time allows, I'll talk about Zn and dihedral groups of order 2n. These are really beautiful, uh, and they're very intuitive. Uh, and I will also at the same time try to play around with Gap and Sage in the terminal to see if I can show anything. Okay, so first, this is something I think almost everyone should be familiar with uh, from linear algebra. So just remember, uh, matrix invertibility depends on it having a non-zero determinant. So in the case of a two by two matrix, uh, the determinant form formula is a, b minus c, d. If it's not zero, we have that a is invertible. Uh, and there's, I'd like two intuitions to think about this, and this is all building up to matri matrix groups. The first intuition is that literally the formula for a two by two matrix inverse is one over its determinant times its adjoint. So what happens if the determinant is zero? We have issues, hold on, there's my highlighter. We have issues in the denominator. This is undefined division. So I guess that's the more boring uh, intuition for why a two by two matrix to, for it to be invertible. Also, I haven't defined invertibility. Invertibility just means that you multiply any matrix by its inverse and you get the in, uh, identity matrix back. This is called identity. And in the case of two by two matrices, it looks like this. Um, an analog to this in the number system is just the number one, because you can multiply it by anything else and it'll give you back your original matrix. If you multiply this matrix by anything else, it'll give you back your original matrix. So we call it identity. Okay, and the inverse is important because we can take any matrix back to identity like that. Okay, so this is the first uh, intuition as to why this determinant has to be non-zero. Uh, 
I think this is a much more beautiful one, which if you've taken linear algebra, you've seen it. Um, so please excuse me if you already know this. Uh, the column vectors of a two by two matrix define a parallelogram in the two dimensional plane on R2, if we have real coefficients. Um, so this column vector, oh, oops. this one corresponds to BD and this one corresponds to AC. Um, together, they form a parallelogram that has area, right? And actually the formula for this area is AD minus BC. So determinant of A is quite literally area of the parallelogram. Um, you can see why it's not invertible. Uh, if, we, if we have zero area for this, that means we're squishing the parallelogram into a line. There's no way to recover information from that. Uh, once you flattened it because the area is zero, there's no way of flipping, reconstructing, or in a mathematical sense, inverting it. So I hope that makes sense. Are there questions in the chat? Let me see. No questions so far. Okay, Maybe cool. I'll ask one as we're going sure. through, because the mathematical concepts are um, abstract for a number of us. If there sure. are things that, that, ways in which we would use some of the things that you're talking about in real life, um, how they map to other things, like you said, the number one, that would be helpful for non-experts in, uh, like myself in math. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, all right, cool. So I'll try to keep like analogies. Yeah, that, that's the point of the talk as well. So <laughs> thank you for reminding me to establish that. Um, so now that we have this intuition for invertibility, I just want to keep that in our mind that there's such a thing as an inverse, there's such a thing um, as identity uh, for matrices, at least two by two matrices, like I just showed. We're going to come back to this slide after we talk about the definition of a group. And now I'll jump into something that is, as Karen was saying, maybe a little closer to us. Um, um, can I so, interrupt one second? There was one question yes. there. So uh, Ryan was asking, how are the second lines in the parallelogram made? Oh, they're parallel. Good question, Ryan. These are just, uh, sorry. These are the same direction. They're just, uh, these two are parallel to each other. That's, yeah, because the, the figure obscures that. But um, this one is also, that makes sense. It's the same direction. Cool. Um, you make them just by constructing. Actually, you just construct this first, and then you make the rest of it. Um, yeah, so that's that one. Okay, so now we're going to talk about something entirely different that has a lot of history behind it. So there is this, just believe me, there is this mathematical structure called a group, uh, which is called the integers modulo n, which to me, I've always thought of it as if you take, imagine if I take all the integers, and by the integers, I mean this set. I mean like the negative numbers, I include zero and I include the positive numbers. I think it comes from the German Zollen, but I don't speak German, so I probably said that wrong. Um, so to me, ever since I learned about it, it's always been a way of like cutting up Z, all these numbers into small little modules. I shouldn't say modules, into these small little nodes um, and calling those groups. So I'll show you what I mean. Computer scientists, uh, you know, uh, Python scientists, you'll run into this all the time. Um, this is equivalent to using the modulus operator. So for example, when I take um, seven modulo four, the remainder of that is three, right? Because I can divide four into seven one time and I have three left over. Well, that's fine. Um, to translate this into group and abstract algebra and modular arithmetic notation, I would say that seven, um, let's see. Okay, it would be seven is equivalent to three modulo four. Right, does that make sense? I hope so, I'll leave this up. So this is something you do all the time, <laughs> like in computer science, it's just, it's the same thing. These are saying the same thing. Um, so Fermat starts noticing a couple of funny little patterns in the integer, right? And 
Um, if you're not familiar with, a, with what a prime is, it's just a number whose divisors are only one in itself. So examples of primes are two. One is never a prime canonically. Um, two, three, five, seven, um, 11. These are numbers that you can't divide by anything else. The only divisors are one and themselves. So for example, 10 is not a prime because 10 is equal to two times five and one times 10. So that's not a prime. Okay, so for Ma said, given a prime, um, the divisor are only one in itself, and any integer in this set, in Z, in the integers, um, A to the P is congruent to A mod P. And we can try this out, right? So this is no, by no means a proof, but it's just an example. So two to the three is two times two times two, that's eight, right? Um, well, that modulo three, this is the same as dividing like this by three with the mod operator. That's where it comes from. Um, that is congruent to two, right? Because six and then the remainder is two. So that means that in that number system called mod three, eight is the same thing as two. They look different, but they are the same shape. They are the same like mathematical creature under the hood, eight and two in mod three. And that's a bit of like a, it's a little funny to think about the first time, but once you start working with it a lot, it's really clear. Um, more importantly, the other formulation of Fermat's little theorem or Fermat's little theorem part two is that if you have that A, oh, 10 minutes up already, I gotta hurry up. If you have that A is not divisible by P, then A to the P minus one is congruent to one mod P. So I'll give you an example, take A to be four, P to be three, so three minus one is equal to four squared is equal to 16. Okay, but that's congruent to one mod three because this is 15 plus one. So if we divide 15 by three, we got zero remainder and one. This is the other formulation of Fermat's little theorem. Now, this is incredibly powerful. I'm not gonna go into it in, in RSA encryption. It's, um, but yeah, okay, I can't start talking about this. Let me focus on the top. Um, so yeah, so this fact from our little theorem suggests the fact that we can cut up the integers to make these like uh, small little nodes where these numbers live. For example, I'll propose that this group consists only of the members of the elements one, two, actually not even two, one and three. That doesn't make much sense. Let me start with a prime number. So I'll suggest that this group, this is called the integers mod five. So mod five, division by five, um, only consists of one, two, three, and four. Why? What is tying them together to make a structure? Um, okay, so I'll explain what's going on here. For that, we need the group definition. No more questions, right? All right. I'll quickly talk, skip around here. Um, so we start thinking about all these things that kind of get grouped together and we wanted to find a mathematical structure. So we say that a set G along with a binary operation is called a group if we have closure, which means that um, you can imagine that we stay inside of this node of this structure. So for example, I'll bring up the example that I said for Z mod four Z under multiplication. I propose that it only had the member one and three. Um, well, let's make a multiplication table for these to see if we stay inside of this group. One times one is one, one times three is three, one times one is one and one times three is three. Three times three is nine, but we are in mod four. So nine mod four is actually one. Okay, this is cool. We multiplied everything in the group together that could possibly exist. And we got back only elements that were in the group. So I can say for sure that these elements have closure. That's what we mean by closure. We can multiply them together and we stay inside the group. Um, I'll keep using this example. And I'll explain later on if we have time why it's only one and three. This is motivated by uh, primality. You only have elements in your group that are relatively prime to whatever your mod is. So that means that you 
they can't have common factors. So I can't have two in there because two and four have a common factor and that's two. Um, I also want to say that for all elements, you need to have an identity. This is why I was talking about identity before. What's the identity here? Well, one is a pretty good candidate for identity because you multiply it by anything else and you get that thing back, right? So call an element G, no, call an element E an identity if you multiply it by anything else in the group and you get the thing back, which is what we're doing here. One times three is three, one times one is one. And then for all elements, we also need to have an inverse. Inverse is what takes it back to the identity. So we can just check our multiplication table for Z mod 4Z and make sure that we have an inverse. So um, one's inverse is one, okay? What's three's inverse? Three's inverse is three. Why? Because three times three is equivalent to nine, is equivalent to nine mod four, is equivalent to one. So that took it back to the identity. I hope this is making sense. Um, we also need associativity, but this one is not so interesting. Uh, you can We can just check this. Associativity means that when you put three things together, so let's say you're multiplying um, one element by another by another, uh, this relation holds. So as in the order of the parentheses, order of multiplication doesn't matter. That's all associativity is. But these are the really interesting ones because these, I think for me, immediately help me identify kind of interesting groups. So that was the example with Z mod 4Z. We're cutting up the integers modulo four and those create these structures called uh, groups, right? Um, something really interesting happened. So for, so there's something called the euler totient function and the euler totient uh, -toshin function, what it counts is, all numbers under n in the integers such that the greatest common divisor of that number and n, let's call it a, so all a, is equal to one. That means that they're not prime, but they are called relatively prime or co-prime. Uh, an example of co-prime integers are five and three. Their only common divisor is one. Another one is 10 and seven. One of these is a prime, one isn't. Their greatest common divisor is one. There's nothing else that divides both of them, bigger than one. So Euler comes along like he does into every field in math. And he says, okay, well, have you noticed that if you define this function, um, the Euler totient function, which counts all numbers under a certain number that are relatively prime to that number, you get the number of elements in all of these groups that you've come up with. I'll give you an example. So Z mod 4Z, to figure out the number of elements in this group, you just count all the things that are relatively prime to four. So we have one, two is not relatively prime because they both share the common factor of two, and you have three and you don't count four because four and four are not relatively prime. You just don't count it. So that's how I formed that group mod four. Another interesting thing, and I'll try to keep this short, I don't want to take up too much time with the lightning talk, is that Z mod 5Z, uh, if you have a prime here, if you make it mod a prime, and 5 is a prime, you get everything right before it, because primes are relatively prime to every other number. So this Z mod 5Z group is 1, 2, 3, 4. That's everything before 5. Uh, and you can try it for yourself. I was going to do it on the call, but maybe not this time around. You can drop the multiplication table and see that mod five, you have closure for all these elements. You just get one, two, three, four, five again in the multiplication table. Okay. And I'm going to skip Z and the additive group. The dihedral groups are really beautiful, but I want to talk about matrix groups first, especially if you are a Pythonista, right? And you work in data science, um, or even not in data science. You see matrices come up in NumPy all the time. So if you have a matrix that's square, any matrix um, with any number in the coefficients, if it's invertible, 
think about all those possible matrices. It can be as big as you want it to be, like n over here by n, a1, an, and so forth. Does that form a group? It actually does, which is really surprising. Um, invertible square matrices form a group. It's actually called the general linear group. It's really important. And it has inverses. Why does it have inverses? Uh, because it's invertible and the determinants are non-zero. Oh, that is the other. They're supposed to have non-zero determinant. They have inverses. You're given that from non-zero determinant. They're not necessarily invertible. Sorry. Um, that's the general linear group. And that question that we had in the beginning is answered now. Why do these matrices need to have non-zero determinant to form a group? They need an inverse. And I'll try to finish my talk up with an introduction to the dihedral groups, but I really want to hear the other one. Okay, so dihedral groups are these groups that explore the symmetries of shapes on the plane. So the first one, uh, where you have called the one gone, we're looking at the line segment in 2D space. Well, the only and the game with the dihedral groups is to ask yourself, what can I do to this shape? How can I manipulate it so that it stays the same, right? Um, and with the line segment, you can do two things. You can flip it, right? So if you have A over here and B over here, you can have B over here and A over here. You can also rotate it by 180 degrees, and that is the same thing. Um, in this group, let's see, flipping by 360 or flipping by zero degrees is identity to call back from concepts from before, right? And we're calling it E. And then rotation by 180, 180 is the only other group element, okay? And we can form a multiplication table and we see that it is this two by two group. It's actually funny because from the Cayley table, you can tell that it's isomorphic to a group that we explored before, which is this one. Um, they have different letters, but it's the same structure. Okay. And here's my drawing of the dihedral group of the two gone. The two gone is really hard to visualize because you can't imagine a polygon with two sides. These two lines are supposed to be infinitely straight, right? Infinitely close and infinitely straight. But I've just drawn them like this, like a graph to make it easier to visualize. Um, so there's four elements in this group. Uh, you can rotate by 180, you can flip, you can compose rotation and flipping. And just with these, like, just with this two gone, look how big your multiplication table gets. By the way, these multiplication tables are called Cayley tables. Um, and these are just the symmetries of the two gone. Um, it gets really interesting when you start working with triangles and squares and the symmetries of those, uh, because you lose commutativity in the group. That means that once you take a shape to something, you can't necessarily do the same thing in the other direction and get the same symmetry. So it gets a little interesting. Um, okay, and I just want to show to, let me see. I want to show, screen share. I just wanted to show that in Sage, you can, if you're interested in exploring this on your own, or if you have to do it for some research project, or just like you think you can prove something about groups, um, Sage, it's uh, compatible with Python. It's a Python library for, it's a computer algebra system that's written in Python. So um, with Sage, you can do all sorts of fun things. So you can do the classic modulo operator. Uh, you can compute greatest common divisor, which I was talking about before. It should be one in this case. Um, you can, Let's see. You can ask Sage if something is prime. Let's put in some huge number. No, it's not prime. Okay, why is it not prime? Give me the factors. I'm not gonna type in that huge number again. And Sage will factor it out for you. I think this is incredible. This is so cool. Um, so that means that all these factors are prime numbers, right? Even this huge one over here. Um, you can also get these Cayley tables. So I've defined A to B, a dihedral group of order four, which is the one I was talking about here, this one, symmetries of the line segment. Um, and we can check the Cayley table. 
A, B, C. Oh, sorry. It's not, it's not the same one. Uh, a is a different one. It's an order up. It's this one. Aha. Uh -huh. So you see different letters, you know, different representations, same structure. It's a four by four multiplication table uh, with identity and two generators. So let me see. Obviously not prime because, yes, good point, Fred. Not prime because the last digit is five. Um, yes. All right. So that was pretty much my talk. Um, I underestimated how long it was going to take me. Uh, but I hope you got a nice taste of group theory. I hope you're a little bit interested. It's a really beautiful field. You get to investigate abstract symmetries. Um, it's very visual if you're a visual person. You can spend a lot of time drawing things out. And matrix groups are incredibly beautiful and relevant if you do data science. OK, and that's my talk. Thank, thank you, Jeff and Karen. Thanks a lot. Great talk. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you, Steve. So I, I have one question. This this may be a, sure. like one of these stupid questions, but um, I've heard there's something I've heard of called category theory, which is used in type systems a bit. Is there any relationship between group theory and category theory? Certainly. Um, I'm not a category theory expert, but it is, um, I think you study group theory and then you keep going into module and ring theory and then representation theory, and then you end up in category theory. So if you want to, I guess you can always start at category theory. It's a, it's a, it's a generalization of a functions and I don't understand it too well, but um, you can always start in group theory and get some of those motivations. Right. Uh, and a lot of people, they love category theory. So there's a question someone is asking, uh, will slides be available after the talk? Are you going to do this? Oh, yes, I can post the slides. Why not? Um, they're missing. Sure, I wanted to draw some other groups, but I'll just send them as is. Um, but I am working long term, maybe in a month, I'll send out an announcement on like a series of blog posts where I explore like the zoo of groups. Um, cool. Yeah. You can add, a, you I would add a comment to uh, the meetup for tonight. Everybody, if they have their alert set, they'll get a notification that you made a comment. And, and so if you have any additional materials or other resources, I'm sure everybody would love to see it. I'm looking forward to the zoo of groups. Thank you. <laughs> um, is there an example of what a data scientist could use group theory for? Aha, you got me. Um, I understand that a lot of scientists use the shape of data to guide their analysis. Um, some group theory is useful for that because you're looking for isomor um, same shapeness between data sets. Um, I also wanted to say, I forgot to mention this, but I did say in the abstract, um, what I'm really interested in is the group isomorphism problem. So if I'm given two groups, some of them are like too big to draw it on paper. Are they the same shape fundamentally? And it turns out that graph isomorphism, so we all care about graphs, um, the graph isomorphism problem telling whether two graphs, like graphs from computer science, are the same graph after a lot of extra material is removed, or if they're essentially the same data, is reducible to the group isomorphism problem. And it's actually faster. Um, the reduction was proved in 1978, but we haven't been able to make progress on group isomorphism because it's right now it's undecidable. Yeah. So I hope that answered your question a little bit. Shape of data and graph, graph isomorphism methods. No problem. All right. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Thanks, Jeff. Uh, hopefully you guys can hear me. Uh, let's say I got really excited at the end there where you're talking about group isomorphism to basically diff two graphs. So I'll have to ask you about that later because that's uh, <laughs> interesting. I'll send you a okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So let me share my screen here. Let me get started here. Okay. Hopefully everyone can see my 
title screen here, evidence for graph databases, specifically evidence for possibly using, hopefully using a graph database in uh, an existing or future project of yours. Okay, granted that everyone can see this, um, for anyone who's a fan of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, you will recognize, hopefully recognize this scene where the character Chris, uh, no, Charles, Charles Kelly, played by Charles Day, not at all confusing, is talking to his coworker, Mac, and trying to convince him that there is this massive conspiracy happening at their company. And to kind of reinforce his sort of craziness and, and his reasoning, behind him is this giant evidence wall. Right, it's got the very typical red lines. Uh, I think they're like plastic strings, with map and lots of different data, and and kind of showing how he's come to this conclusion that there is this great conspiracy. So I've always known this as an evidence wall, but in researching for this talk, I have since discovered that it goes by many many terms. Um, I think the official Hollywood trope name is string theory, uh, presumably because of the strings attaching to objects. Uh, but one of my favorites is crazy wall and obsession wall, which are, are two other terms uh, that are very useful for finding content related to evidence walls. Okay, in my discovery process, the earliest example of an evidence wall that I've discovered is in the original 1979 uh, miniseries from BBC, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, which is based off of the book that the newer movie with uh, Gary Oldman is, is based off of. Uh, but in this one, uh, we have Alec Guinness, who uh, played uh, a role in this, this series. And of course, we all know Alec Guinness from Star Wars. He played Obi-Wan Kenobi alongside uh, Harrison Ford. And Harrison Ford also played a part in Apocalypse Now. Um, and also doing a small bit was Lawrence Fishburne, who happened to be the starring actor in a 1990s movie called Deep Cover, which was the earliest movie I could find with the use of uh, uh, evidence board or evidence um, wall. Okay, so a little history on uh, evidence walls through throughout uh, media. And why, why am I talking about evidence walls? Uh, hopefully it's kind of apparent. The, uh, the use of this trope, right, is, is using some thing that connects different disparate pieces of data or different seemingly unconnected individuals. Usually the red string, red line is, is the most typical. Uh, but in using these lines or some sort of mechanism to connect these different things, we are creating a network. And a network, of course, is a graph. And graph databases uh, run graphs, right? OK. So why, are, why should we as Python developers be interested in, in graph databases at all? Well, if you are running the back end for your application or your project, then of course you should definitely know about the whole scope of graph databases in general, right? Because more tools in the toolkit, always a good thing. But even if you don't uh, interface with the database directly, you are likely to work with other people who are interested in what graph databases can provide, right? Data engineers, uh, the people who build the data pipeline, um, kind of get everything set up to, to to move data to data warehouses or out of data warehouses into like BI tools that the data analysts will use. So data analysts would, would be very likely to be interested in the insights that a graph data system or graph technology can, can provide. And then of course, you've got data mad scientists who are on the cutting edge of AI and ML. Um, they're interested in, in all things that, you know, that can easily go into an ML pipeline. And this group is probably the, the most likely group to actually have a graph theory background and be already familiar with graph databases uh, uh, coming in. Okay, now why would why is this group of folks in the data science team interested? Well, according to Gartner, the overwhelming majority of data innovations coming down the pipe in the next few years is going to come from graph technologies. And to kind of support this um, this prediction is this very graph database friendly uh, chart from DB Engines. So this chart, uh, if you can see it, is showing the change of popularity for a given database technology over time. Uh, so we can see here that green line that's all the way at the top is graph databases. And that red line all the way at the bottom is uh, relational database management systems. Now, to be clear, this is not showing the relative popularity of database systems to each other, right? Because we all know RDBSs and SQL, at Postgres, everyone's using SQL at this moment, right? It's like easily 90 some percent of all databases in use. What this is showing is the change in popularity for a given system 
over time really against itself. So this is showing that as time increases, the number of people getting into graph databases is climbing at a quite an impressive rate. Uh, and you can you can barely see that the popularity of SQL databases is going down, which you know it makes sense with all these other new technologies coming on board and SQL, you know, kind of reaching uh, quite a quite an interesting age milestone. Okay, so now that we know why uh, a good number of folks would be interested in graph technologies, what exactly is a graph database? How does it work? What does it look like? Okay, so in general, graph databases is one of four broad categories of NoSQL databases, right? The others being document, key value stores, column family. And uh, here I've put up a few examples, you know, major names like MongoDB, Redis, Snowflake. These are all other NoSQL options. Okay, now what makes a graph database different from these other database options? is how it uh, stores data, obviously. So in a graph database, you're gonna have a node or in uh, a vertex, if you're coming from a graph theory background, and then a relationship to another node. Uh, relationships are edges in graph theory. So in the database, that relationship is stored as a first class citizen, right? It's stored along with the node data. This is uh, compared to like an SQL database where that relationship is typically created at query time, right? That relationship is usually a join statement. Now there are other things you could do in an SQL database. You could create intermediary tables and et cetera. But generally speaking, uh, relationships are not part of the data store with other database types. Now in a property graph, you can add properties or attributes to the node or relationships, right? So the node, you can give the name, a title, release date, et cetera. And the relationship, you can give the same sort of data or you can give it weights, right? So you can see where this is starting to look somewhat like a neural graph and you can actually run ML pipelines in graph databases uh, directly and then use them on themselves uh, with, with some additional packages. Okay, so this is a property graph, which is one type of graph database. Okay, general pros. Uh, when you don't, you generally don't have joins like you do in SQL. Uh, so because you don't have the joins, you can traverse the data uh, much easier. So if you're going to do just general data discovery, or you just want to, if you want to focus on analyzing the data, it's generally easier in a graph database. Uh, it not only visualizes very well, but just uh, just traversing the queries you would need to traverse the data is um, is, is relatively simple, simpler. Uh, schema optional, which means you can just kind of start dumping data into a graph database. You know, you can give something even like a placeholder label, types, properties, and you can change that later. Uh, your queries against data in a graph database, if your general schema changes, will not break um, uh, queries. Your queries will just return only the nodes and relationships that have, meet the query parameters. So if you've added something new and you query for something new, <clears throat> it will just ignore the, the old data that doesn't have the up-to-date schema. Uh, but it's easy enough to go into a graph database and update older stuff. So it makes iterating your, your, your data model uh, very easy. Now, some things where graph databases are definitely not something you'd want to go for is if you're not analyzing the data at all. If you're just, you know, you're just pounding, you're just putting in tons of transactions, you're logging in data, and you really don't want to look at it again, graph databases are not going to give you anything, right? In fact, it's, uh, it's probably, it wouldn't be your recommended first solution. Um, <clears throat> so if all that doesn't make uh, graph databases when you should and shouldn't use it, um, kind of clear, I love this sort of cheat sheet, cheat sheet graphic uh, from Intro to Data Science by uh, Manning Publishing. So on the y-axis, we got the, the amount of data that, you, that you're handling. And then on the x-axis, you got the complexity of data, uh, complexity being you know, kind of interconnected data or you know, if the data is not as standardized as you would like. So if you got just a heap of data, go for a key value store, right? Once you get past you know, where SQL is solid, start, start going looking that way. But if you have very complex, very nested, very networked sort of data, graph databases is gonna be your best bet, right? So, okay, so now that we pretty much know what a graph database is, generally speaking, what are some of the use cases? Okay, now there are tons and tons of use cases. Uh, you can use a graph database as a general data store, which is perfectly fine. Um, but where 
graphs really shine is in a number of particular fields. Now, here I'm going to talk about the Panama Papers because this is how I first learned of graph databases and, and Neo4j was when I learned of the Panama Papers. So if you're not already aware, it was about maybe six, seven years ago that uh, the International Consortium of in Investigative Journalists got this huge data dump from some law firm by someone in there who got tired of I can think being involved with this giant global financial conspiracy. So they gave them this giant data dump and they were looking and they were trying to tackle it with like Excel sheets and everything prior. And it was, it was just too much. So what they ended up doing was putting all this data into a graph database, Neo4j's database, and then putting a Linkarius interface on top of it, which allowed the journalists to more easily query the data. And, and over, I think a period of one or two years, journalists from across the globe secretly together somehow, uh, slowly pieced together all the interconnections between, maybe not all, but a vast majority of the interconnections between a bunch of major players in this conspiracy. And when this paper was released, a lot of prime ministers were, uh, prime ministers, uh, presidents of banks, a bunch of folks either lost their jobs and or were prosecuted and, and jailed for uh, the crimes that they were involved with. And I think two congressional bills pa were passed run through the um, legislature and pass because of this uh, to help strengthen the um, financial markets. Okay, so other uh, uh, common use cases that, uh, that are often um, useful for graph databases, social networks, obviously, friend of a friend, and then from an extension from that, recommendations, right? So if you haven't bought a particular thing, a system could recommend that based on your friend's shopping behavior or more likely other people who have, whose shopping behavior is similar to yours, however many hops away and recommend products uh, that way uh, can help with some compliance, knowledge graphs, obviously, uh, fraud detection, which is similar to the ICIJ um, story, but really uh, for banks these days, this is this has become a huge thing. Uh, being able to detect, ab being able to detect abnormal, be abnormal behavior and uncover crime rings. Okay. Uh, and then last, life sciences, there are some very impressive pharmaceutical companies who are doing digital drug discovery. So, and this is a little bit beyond me, but basically they're using graph databases to look at existing drugs, uh, active ingredients and their effects on people. And based on basically selecting like, okay, I want a drug that does X, Y, Z and only has A, B, C side effects. What compound should I put, should I put together and test? Uh, a graph database system can can give that prediction to them. Okay, graph databases, use cases. Now, who are the major players currently in this field? There are, uh, according again to DB Engines, who have taken a lot of information, right? They've taken a lot of uh, Google and Bing searches, Google Trends, people's LinkedIn profiles, um, requests for certain skills on hiring platforms, and the amount of traffic through uh, DB Stack Exchange. And they've run it through some sort of magic algorithm and they've come up with a scoring mechanism and, and presented a ranked list of top graph databases. So you can see here in this list, this is just the, the top snippet of the top 10. You can see that uh, Neo4j and Cosmos DB are, that scoring has them well above uh, everyone else. So if you are starting off Greenfield, you never, uh, touch graph databases and no one on your team has any prior skills, then you know, obviously this, this list is something you should consider. Your personal top 10 is gonna change, of course, depending on the, the tech stack of your team. If, for example, everyone on the team is very good with AWS and someone already knows Gremlin, which is a, um, a graph query language that, that you can use on Neptune and some other uh, uh, databases, those will obviously rank personally higher for you. Okay, so from this list, this can be broken down to three, uh, actually four categories, but we'll just focus on these three. Uh, first one is property graphs, which I've talked about already. Uh, next in the middle is semantic graphs, which, uh, let's see if I can zoom in a little. All right. Okay, so you can see here semantic graphs are a little bit different than property graphs. Semantic graphs, you can't store properties or attributes to nodes or relationships. Everything is, is contained in this triple store, right? You have a subject, predicate object, and kind of all the information you would put into uh, properties, you can store this way, right? So you're doing the subject predicate to the value, right? So if your thing has a name, you just point it to that string value, right? The thing has a release date of some date value. 
uh, or that 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 movie is uh, produced by some person, right? So you can connect it to objects and values, and that's a semantic graph, also known as a uh, triple store. <laughs> okay, and the last general group, uh, which isn't really a unique graph database type, but more of a conglomerate type, is our multi-model databases. And these databases, uh, basically, you can put not any, but near any sort of source data and then what, including other graph databases. And then on top of that, you use their query language, ideally one that basically goes through all the disparate data points and finds whatever it is you're looking for. Now, the the um, the amount of overhead to run a multi-model instance is generally higher than the other two types, uh, but you know each each have their their strengths and 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 you know. You know, weaknesses, but uh, they have different areas where they're a little bit stronger in math. Okay, now those top 10 graph database companies, this is uh, how they stack in comparison to that categorical breakdown, right? So everything on the right are property graphs, in the middle are semantic graphs, and then multi-model on the left. Okay, so this is only the top 10 graph database companies. And so when you add in all the rest, you can imagine you get basically a giant smorgasbord of graph query languages, which uh, you know nobody in their right mind would want to all learn of. Fortunately, there is a working group uh, of folks from some of those graph database companies and a couple of universities who have gotten together and they are trying to create a ISO standard graph query language, right? So they're making the GQL standard. Now, there are, they are already halfway through their um, planned lifetime. So they started back in 2019, and the ISO standard is expected to be ready by early uh, 2024. Now, graph query language should not be confused with GraphQL, which is a better REST alternative. Right? It's an API interface developed by a few folks at Facebook and um, is now, uh, I think they I think they officially sponsor its development. Uh, fantastic protocol. Um, if you haven't used it before, I definitely recommend you take a look at it. It will save you like a, a lot of headache, but, but it is not um, the same as the graph query language that is uh, under development. Okay, now back to that GQL. These are the 10 graph query languages that they are referencing to create the new query language. Now, uh, we don't have the time and nor do I have the uh, technical expertise to go through all these 10 types. And in about you know, two to four years, you, you won't need to. But uh, just to showcase the variations of query languages, I'm just gonna talk about uh, three. Uh, OpenCypher, which was developed by Neo4j, Gremlin, which I, uh, well, I'll, I'll talk about each, but anyways, OpenCypher, Gremlin, and Sparkle. First one I'll talk about is Sparkle, which I think is the oldest, uh, released originally in 2008 by the, or supported by the W3C consortium. And this was designed for the triple stores for RDF uh, use. And you can see it in the way they set up their queries. So let me zoom in here. So you can see it borrows from SQL a little bit. And they've got this very distinct, uh, three word pattern, which is the subject object predicate and these question marks in front of things. Now the question marks denotes variables. And so long story short, this query is looking for uh, a person object whose name is Lawrence Fishburne and to return the name of all the objects associated with this that are uh, of the friend type. Right. And its return will give you something like this, right? It'll give you a package with some header information. And the interesting bit would be under this uh, results bindings key um, here. Okay, so that is uh, Sparkle query. And if you wanted to play around with Sparkle, there is this great playground that somebody has created, Sparkle QL dash playground. And it is a preloaded data set. So you can just go in there and practice reads. Uh, I don't think you can write to it, uh, but you know, give it a go. Uh, and then on the right-hand side is a list of examples that you can click on to, to populate pre-populate queries. So this is a good way to um, get familiar with Sparkle if, if you want to go, go there. Okay, next language I'll talk about is Cypher, uh, which is the newest of the, the three. Uh, it was first released in 2015, uh, again, by Neo4j. Um, the latest major version was 
released back in 2017. And there's been some updates, but uh, no, no major releases since then. And it's used by a lot of different companies, uh, which I didn't show here, but anyways. Okay, so focusing on the query, on the uh, query language. So you can see here, uh, Cypher is kind of this ASCII art-esque uh, language. And we, we do away with the select and we replace it with uh, this match statement. And so the key things here is everything in a parenthesis is a node and everything in a bracket is a relationship. So you can see where this ASCII art thing comes. And you can use this uh, pattern to denote patterns that you're wanting to look for. So this is a very simple one. This is actually one of the, the only thing simpler is looking for a single node, but this is looking for one of the most simplest patterns. But you can, you can keep going, right? You can go like, no, so-and-so who acted in a movie who in that movie was produced by so-and-so. So you can chain these long patterns uh, and then also add um, filters using the where uh, keyword. Um, so this statement is basically doing the same as the Sparkle example I, I showed earlier, which is just returning the names of all of Lawrence Fishburne's uh, friends who are people. Uh, and here it'll return something like this, where the payload will be in an array of, in this case, because I'm asking for a list uh, inside this names key value. Okay. So if you want to play with Cypher, there are actually a couple companies who have playgrounds. Uh, Memcraft is another company that has a great um, like Cypher tutorial and, and playground system. Uh, but here, this is Neo4j's sandbox instance. Uh, this is the Neo4j Cypher browser specifically. So here you can enter in uh, queries at the top, get the interface here, and you can switch between views for like straight table views, data, uh, graph. And you can kind of do some data discovery in there. And there are many, many data sets that you could choose from, uh, including a movie database and ICIJ's most recent um, paper, the Paradise Papers. Um, Panama Papers is somewhere available. It is public, but um, uh, of the preloaded data sets that we have available, um, we have the Paradise Papers uh, instead, which I believe is smaller. Okay, so that is Cypher Playground. So the last language I will talk about is Gremlin, which was originally released uh, just shortly after Sparkle, uh, but definitely kept up to date. Uh, in fact, it was just this summer they released the newest version 3.6.4, I believe. So very active. Um, and, and oh yes, Gremlin was originally, uh, it came out of the Apache Tinkerpop uh, group. Okay, so here, now their query language is uh, substantially different from um, Cypher and Sparkle. So here it's got this uh, kind of builder pattern, right? So basically you're, you're calling functions on functions uh, to denote what traversal you want to do. Uh, so G here just represents the Gremlin uh, implementation or uh, whatever driver that you've implemented that runs Gremlin. And then V uh, is vertex, right? So Gremlin is using uh, graph theory's uh, nomenclature. So vertex that has or is just a person label and they're named Lawrence Fishburne. Out E means find me an outbound edge relationship to a other vertice and return me the name value of those vertices. So here I, I made a mistake because I am not a gremlin expert. I originally wanted to just return the people, uh, the friends of Lawrence Fishburne, but this query would actually return you the name of every single vertice attached with Lawrence Fishburne which fortunately in my test database, I only had people, but it will return a payload similar to this, right? a list of, of names. Okay, now if you wanna play with Gremlin, there is this great uh, site that somebody has put up, gremlify.com. And here on the upper left, you, you have a, uh, a query builder. Uh, lower left is the response from the, uh, the test instance. And then on the right-hand side is a graphical interface. So similar to uh, Neo4j's browser, right? You can view the incoming data. Uh, you can also switch to a mode where you're creating the data uh, you know, graphically. Uh, Neo4j has another tool for that, but, but this is nice because it's all here in one tool. Okay, uh, one last thing about Gremlin is uh, because Gremlin uses this particular pattern. So both Sparkle and Cypher at least with the most popular drivers out there, you are basically, as a, as a Python developer, you are, you are creating a string representation of the query and you pass in the string of that query with the uh, variable arguments into a driver. And then that will make the, the outbound calls uh, for you. But with Gremlin, the most popular driver, um, because it has this pattern, you, you literally put 
this this query, this this native uh, Gremlin query, uh, more or less, you put this right into a uh, into a, a Python driver call. Uh, so, you know, if that's the thing for you, that's a uh, uh, that's kind of a nice nice touch. Okay, that I believe is everything you might possibly need to get started with graph databases. Um, uh, if if none of it's stuck, uh, I'd like just to remind you that if you don't remember what a graph database is, just think of an evidence board or a crazy wall and know that that is a physical representation of what a graph database is. Uh, only you could do that times a million, a billion nodes and relationships. Okay. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Oh, I see a question. Uh, let's see, Jeff, should I just read this question off from uh, Monte? Sure. Okay. Go ahead. Monte asks, is the ISO GQL standard going to be similar to one of the three query languages you mentioned, or is it going to be something new? That is a great question. I don't actually know. Um, I haven't seen any documentation of what, what they're leaning toward at this moment. Uh, let's see if I go back here. Um, you can kind of narrow it down by their length. Well, no, I mean, Gremlin is so much different than Cypher. Yeah, I I wish I knew. I would be super curious to know what they are starting to lean to because then, then I could start reading up more on that. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I imagine it's going to be net new, but it will probably look a lot like one of the existing languages. There's some questions uh, down in the chat. You want me to read them out to you? Uh, yes, please. So one is, can I do a def first search or breadth first search on a graph database? Yes, you can do both. Um, uh, I should prepare an example for that. But uh, yeah, anyways, yes, you can do you can do both and. Uh, Trying to remember, you know, I'll just look it up and I'll post a link somewhere to, to give you more details on that since I'm drawing a blank at the moment. Sure, that'd be great. So another question is, do graph databases have concepts like indices for optimization? Yes. So yeah, you can add constraints and indexes to speed up the, uh, the queries, uh, but they're not, they're not, uh, they're not required. Okay, and that was from Joel. And uh, let's see, oh, you got a compliment from Richard on your evidence wall and oh, said on your talk. You. So Chris Chris has a question. Um, would you remind us what a semantic graph is and maybe share an example? Okay, yes. So semantic graph is a little bit different than the property graph here, right? It's It's that triple pattern, right? The subject, predicate, object. And uh, an example of that would be, uh, well, Amazon Neptune could do that, but, um, oh, Sparkle. Uh, Sparkle is basically only used for semantic graphs. So that would be this, right? So here, right, looking for a friend, um, a friend type object. Ooh, okay, so it's been a while since I played with this uh, Sparkle query. So again, so the semantic graphs require that 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 subject uh, subject predicate object pattern, and this where statement is going through that defined uh, both the name associated with the the object of interest, and then find the name of the associated objects tied to that. So it's all in these this comp this tree of of triplets. Hopefully that helps. Did I answer your question? Are the abilities from RDF being implemented and by which system? Oh, like uh, what companies use RDFs? So uh, my understanding is they're used widely in, um, I think, older graph systems. But um, I couldn't tell you like one company and what product uh, off the top of my head is, is using RDFs. Uh, there, sh there should be a lot. I should I should know, but uh, I can't think of any at the moment. And there were a couple questions, a couple people asking independently. I think, what tool did you use to build your presentation? They thought it was really cool. Oh yes, 
So this is Miro, and I hadn't actually been aware until I started this that Miro has added a presentation feature, right? So normally in the editing mode, this is what it looks like in an editing mode, right? You've got all your normal tools, but on the, if you put things in frames, right? So if you create a frame here, if you put things in frames, it treats it as a, a slide in a presentation and you can view it uh, you can jump to things directly. So you can play it one of two ways. You can play it like the way I was, which is you're kind of gliding across your entire canvas, or you can play it as a straight uh, presentation and see if I can figure that out. Yeah. So here you could run it like a normal, like Google slide. Uh, so this is a, uh, this is a pretty cool feature. Uh, I was really impressed with it. The only downside, well, the only major downside at the moment is that there is no presentation mode. So I can't run this with two screens. I can't put notes that everyone can't see. Um, and that, you know, sort of those extra presenter features. But but, uh, but it worked out fine for an evidence board because it's an evidence board. So I could literally put all my notes here for everyone to see and it, it works just fine. <laughs> okay. So some other questions from Steve. Which graph database is the most natural or best to use with Python? Oh, okay. So that's that's a very <laughs> that's a very uh, opinionated and subjective answer. But uh, so that one's really going to depend on uh, a combination of which uh, database query language you kind of prefer, and also what packages you're using. Right. So, like like Cipher, for example, since I know Cipher the best, like using the direct driver if you don't know Cypher can be kind of, it's, it's definitely, it's gonna be a road, road bump, right? A uh, speed bump, because you gotta learn Cypher before you can pass it any sort of meaningful information. But there are packages, community packages you can do that make uh, creating the Cypher query Pythonic, right? So it turns it into a kind of a builder pattern where you can put in like, okay, node, blah, 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 with you know an argument value, et cetera. And it will convert that into a query string that you can pass into, um, uh, into a driver. And then there's other packages that even abstract further away and um, and, and kind of make uh, certain functions much easier because it just kind of abstracts away having to use the query uh, language at all. So yeah, it's, uh, I don't know if I have a, a number one. Uh, I mean, I work for Neo4j, so I would recommend you look at that one first. Uh, but um, uh, that being said, uh, I would definitely also take a look at Gremlin because of um, that builder pattern. Um, and if you come from a graph theory background, maybe staying to vertices and edges is simple. I don't know. Uh, but there are limitations to Gremlin because Gremlin is, I think its strength is in traversals, which you can kind of see in its pattern. But doing other, pivoting to other graph science-y stuff is trickier, or may, maybe not even possible in Gremlin, I'm not sure. Uh, but in Cypher with, uh, especially the graph data science package, you can do a lot of very impressive stuff with uh, the database. So for example, like I said earlier, you can run an, uh, an ML pipeline right in, uh, right in the database and not only train something, but then take that training and apply it to something and then give you the result from that. Um, yeah, so uh, start with any of the top 10 you will probably be, uh, be happy with any of those. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, Jerome asks, Neo4j has been around forever. Is it the leader of the pack? Uh, I believe it is. Uh, according to DB Engines, it is. Uh, from what we hear around, we're still number one. Um, uh, you know, but we Neo4j basically made the category. And... Uh, but it's okay. Like we're we're all okay. The CEO is okay with lots of uh, other companies being in this space because that shows that there's value in this. And some of the the products from other companies that, that are coming uh, that are available are also very interesting, right? Everyone's kind of tackling this sort of space a little bit differently, uh, and the market's clearly big enough for for everyone to play in. Okay. Did I miss any questions? You're very welcome. I think that was everything. Anyone else have a, a question? There was a question from Joel. Is GQL pronounced geekquel? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, I, I'm assuming after the ISO standard comes out, they will tell us how we should be pronouncing this because uh, 
they're probably going to want to distinguish from GraphQL. Um, so 